Honorable Secretary East, Honorable Vice Chancellor, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar and a very good morning to you all. My name is Rajiv Ranjan Chaturvedi, and I welcome each one of you present here to today's colloquium on BIMSTEC and the Bay Navigating the Future. With the permission of the Honorable Vice Chancellor and the Chair of the inaugural session, I begin today's program. First and foremost, I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor to welcome and felicitate our chief guest, Sri Jaydeep Majumdar, Secretary East, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Thank you, sir. I have the honor to be the first coordinator of the Center for Bay of Bengal Studies at Nalanda University. The center was announced by Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji during the fourth BIMSTEC summit. And I am grateful to Nalanda University and particularly our Vice Chancellor for giving me this opportunity to work on the Bay of Bengal region. BIMSTEC represent a vibrant platform encompassing seven nations, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. United by the Bay of Bengal, these nations are interconnected by a shared vision of fostering regional cooperation and sustainable development. The unique ecology of BIMSTEC is witnessing enriched political support and commitment from India. Secretary East, despite his super busy schedule, has joined us as a testimony to India's sincerity towards the Bay of Bengal region. Undoubtedly, BIMSTEC holds a special significance for India in a changing mental map of the region. India has made the Bay of Bengal integral to India's neighborhood first and activist policies, which can accelerate the process of regional integration. BIMSTEC matters for India as well as for the region. The BIMSTEC charter and other recent developments present signs of optimism and the comeback of the Bay of Bengal as a new economic and a strategic space. The economic and a strategic significance of the Bay of Bengal is growing rapidly with the re-emergence of the idea of Indo-Pacific region. The renewed focus has given a new lease of life to the developmental efforts uh, taken by India and all member countries in the region. BIMSTEC has huge potential as a natural platform for development cooperation and the Bay of Bengal region can leverage its unique position as a bridge linking South and Southeast Asia. There has been tangible progress in BIMSTEC cooperation in several areas, including security, counterterrorism, intelligence sharing, cybersecurity, coastal security, transport connectivity, and uh, many other uh, areas. The Bay stands as a critical nexus for trade, commerce, and cultural exchange. It serves as a maritime lifeline connecting nations, not only geographically, but also economically and culturally. In our discussions today, uh, we will explore the opportunities and challenges that defines this crucial region, from maritime security and economic integration to environmental sustainability and cultural diplomacy. BIMSTEC nations navigate a complex array of issues that shape their collective future. Our esteemed speakers and participants will shed light on how BIMSTEC is poised to leverage its strength and tackle its challenges in the coming years. Through insightful dialogues and collective efforts, we aim to chart a course that ensures prosperity, stability, and resilience for all stakeholders in the Bay of Bengal region. So with this introduction, I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, to welcome our chief guest and other dignitaries and to share his thoughts with us. Over to you, sir. Namaskar. Our honorable chief guest, Ambassador Mr. Jaydeep Mazumdar, who is Secretary East in the, in the Ministry of External Affairs and has been associated with the 
building up of Nalanda University since its inception. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir, and to our most distinguished speakers today, respected Dr. Rajat M. Nag, Professor Sri Radha Datta, Mr. Sabhisachi Datta, Dr. Biswanjit Singh, to our esteemed guest, Vice Chancellor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor R.K. Sinha, and our officers from the OTA Gaya, and all my colleagues, our journalist friends who are here from different newspapers and um, media, our colleagues of the university and dear students. A very warm welcome to each one of you and to all who are attending and participating in the colloquium today, which is the BIMSTEC and the Bay Navigating the Future. Here at Nalanda University, we, this colloquium is also a part of navigating the future of Nalanda University because we are closely associated, sir, with the BIMSTEC and the ASEAN students from, from these countries. So it's a privilege to have you all gathered here today as we delve into discussions that are not just academically enriching, but also deeply significant for regional cooperation and development. Previously, we had held two BIMSTEC colloquium with scholarly contributions that enthused us to move on with our focus on the future trajectory of the BIMSTEC. We owe to respected Secretary East for his encouragement and guidance to us in this way and sparing his time to attend this today. We look to your guidance and your vision by which I think the center and this whole theme would be enriched. The religious, academic and cultural landscape of Nalanda holds a special connection towards the region's towards its east. Nalanda's revival has reaffirmed its historic role as a bridge between India's neighborhood and its extended neighborhood. The university's commitment to fostering intellectual exchanges and promoting regional cooperation is exemplified by the establishment of the Center for Bay of Bengal Studies and its proactive engagement with initiatives like BIMSTEC. The Center of Bay of Bengal Studies had offered a certificate program besides organizing two major colloquiums, as has been referred here earlier. Recently, we have been honored by our Honorable Prime Minister by his visit here and inaugurating this new campus. His sterling words in the learned address touched each one of us. He reminded us that Nalanda holds the heritage of many nations. That makes us feel all the more responsible and conscious of our role. At the same memorable event, we also had the honor of hosting the ambassadors from the BIMSTEC countries at the campus. So quite significantly in the present times, the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, that is BIMSTEC, also embodies the spirit of cooperation among the nations bordering the Bay of Bengal. At Nalanda, we are proud to host several BIMSTEC students pursuing various courses across disciplines. And they are also recipients of the BIMSTEC Fellowship that is provided by our Honorable Chief Guest here from his office. And these young scholars contribute not only to the academic vibrancy of our campus, but also enrich our cultural diversity in the campus. Looking ahead, Nalanda University is keen to expand its engagement with the BIMSTEC countries and with other initiatives such as student exchange programs, collaborative research endeavors, and, and partnerships within frameworks like the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative. Honorable Chief Guest, Sir, under your guidance, we are prepared to play a bigger role 
as you might be visualizing for all of us. I want to assure you that we are ready to actively participate in various engagements as you may assign us to do while we continue our academic courses enriching the academic activities. Our commitment to deeper engagement is also reflected in initiatives like the Common Archival Research Center, Resource Center that we have here, and our newest addition is the School of International Relations and Peace Studies. We are beginning the MA program in IR and Peace Studies in this upcoming semester. I believe that these institutes shall serve as crucial platforms for a scholarly discourse and policy development aiming to address regional challenges and opportunities. As we continue to grow academically stronger, Nalanda University seeks to carve out a significant role in regional affairs as I requested you, sir, and we believe that our institution can and should play a pivotal role in shaping the intellectual discourse and that will define our collective future. Today's colloquium serves as a testament to our shared commitment to harnessing the potential of regional cooperation through this platform like the BIMSTEC. So I appeal to all of you participating in this seminar that with your discussions ahead and your support coming us in future, together we navigate through a future of greater connectivity, cooperation, and prosperity in the Bay of Bengal region. I welcome Chief Guest Ambassador Jadeep Majumdarji and all the esteemed speakers and our guests and our journalist friends and my own colleagues here and sincerely thank you for your presence. I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our uh, chief guest today, uh, Ambassador uh, Jaydeep Majumdar. Uh, Ambassador Majumdar, born in Silong, India, joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1989. Most recently, he has been ambassador of India to Austria, the Holy See, and Montenegro, and permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Vienna. He was also governor on the board of governors of the IAEA during this time and chair of the plenary of the Wassenegger arrangement. Prior to that, he was ambassador to the Philippines, Palau, and the Federated States of Micronesia. In his career of over 34 years, he had served in various diplomatic capacities in China, Hong Kong, and Beijing, uh, in Bangladesh, um, at United Nations in uh, New York and in Cairo in Egypt. He has also served as the Deputy Chief of Missions in Beijing and in Kathmandu. Uh, in fact, I had the uh, privilege to meet you, sir, in uh, your posting in Beijing also and in Manila, both the places. Um, in his uh, stint in New Delhi, he had served in the Prime Minister's Office on Foreign Affairs, Defense and Security Issues, Atomic Energy and Space as the Chief of Protocol and as head of the Southern Division in the Ministry of External Affairs of India, looking after bilateral relations with countries in Southeast Asia as well as Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island countries. Concurrently, he then also headed the Nalanda Division in the Ministry of External Affairs, charged with the revival of the ancient Nalanda University and East Asia Summit Initiative. Ambassador Majumdar assumed the position of Secretary East in the Ministry of External Affairs on 11th of March uh, this year. He holds bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in management. Apart from English language, he is conversant in Assamese, Bengali, Hindi, and Chinese. Traveling, reading, and music are his interests. He is married to uh, Parvati C. Majumdar, a formal civil servant and now an education consultant. They have two children, a son, Ronoje, an economic journalist, and a daughter, Debolina, a behavioral data scientist. With such a vast experience, we are very uh, delighted to have you, sir, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, for that very, very elaborate uh, introduction. Um, first of all, namaskar and good morning to all of you. I'm delighted to be back uh, here in 
this beautiful campus of Nalanda University. I was uh, uh, on a morning walk today morning and uh, couldn't help but uh, appreciate the beauty of the campus. Uh, I was here three weeks ago and at that time it was rather dry because you had, uh, I think, had a drought for two years. But uh, I was very happy to see the drains have come and uh, everything is lush and green. Uh, but uh, the lesson from all this is that even with two years of drought, the university still managed uh, well because of your rain ha water harvesting and the water bodies around you. So it's a lesson for all uh, how to uh, tackle climate change with uh, these uh, very simple technologies, but uh, that require foresight and planning. So I'm delighted to be back, and it was only at the same time three weeks ago that the Prime Minister of India inaugurated this campus in the presence of the representatives of 17 other nations. As some of you who were there may remember, the Honorable Prime Minister in his speech at the inauguration underlined Nalanda's global legacy and its connections to many countries, particularly to the countries of the neighborhood. He emphasized the idea of sharing of knowledge and global collaboration that is crucial in these modern times. The vision of Nalanda is of a place where students and teachers from all over the world gather to learn and grow as they did all those hundreds of years ago. And it is a powerful reminder of the spirit of Vasudeva Kutumbakam that the world is one family. It is therefore only fitting that this center for Bay of Bengal studies is located in the campus of the new Nalanda University. And it is more than appropriate to have a discussion here on BIMSTEC and the Bay navigating the future. I commend the Center for Bay of Bengal Studies at this university for convening this timely colloquium. I'm aware that you have also convened two major colloquiums earlier, focused on maritime security and on connectivity in the Bay of Bengal region. I applaud Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, and I also applaud Professor Rajiv Chaturvedi and other colleagues for prioritizing the Bay of Bengal in their research agenda. Similarly, the launch of the School of International Relations and Peace Studies at this university promises to make Nalanda once again a major center for international exchanges and scholarly research. As you all know, BIMSTEC was established in 1997 with a vision to bring together the countries around the Bay of Bengal to work toward a common future. From its initial beginnings as BISTEC, covering Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, it has evolved to include Myanmar, Nepal, and Bhutan as well. And we see this as a natural enlargement, bringing our partners in sub-regional cooperation into the regional fold for the benefit of all. Our journey has been marked by significant milestones. In 2014, the establishment of a permanent secretariat in Dhaka anchored our activities, providing a solid foundation for our endeavors. The sheer number and breadth of cooperative activities undertaken by BIMSTEC in the past few years is truly impressive. Today, as all member states are preparing to adopt our first ever vision document at the forthcoming summit in Bangkok, we are setting a clear path for our future, guided by our shared aspirations and common goals. Two days from now, the foreign ministers of the BIMSTEC countries are meeting in a retreat in New Delhi. No doubt, there will be significant outcomes from this event that is being held to brainstorm on the path ahead. We noticed today a great deal of enthusiasm among the member states of BIMSTEC to work together on many diverse subjects. The new Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Indramani Pandey, is also energizing the Secretariat and giving it more capacity to deliver. And this is all very timely. BIMSTEC's significance cannot be overstated. Together, our seven nations represent a combined population of 1.8 billion people, nearly 22% of the global population. This demographic strength is complemented by our strategic geographic positioning 
at the crossroads of South Asia and Southeast Asia, making BIMSTEC a unique bridge between two vital regions. However, while our population size is vast, our joint economic potential remains largely untapped. Our combined GDP of $4.5 trillion and external trade of $1.95 trillion signify the immense opportunities that lie ahead. To realize this potential, we must focus on leveraging our strengths and addressing our challenges through cooperative efforts. India's vision for BIMSTEC is one of inclusive growth, sustainable development, and regional peace, security, and stability. We are ready to share our capabilities with all BIMSTEC member states, be they in the areas of agriculture, energy, health, or the digital space, to name only a few. We wish to support economic growth in our neighborhood through collaborative projects that enhance trade, investment, and economic development. The ultimate objective is a better future for all our citizens. We view and the following as key areas of cooperation for our common future. First, in trade, investment, and economic development, enhancing trade liberalization, simplifying customs procedures, and harmonizing standards to facilitate smoother and more efficient trade across our borders. Second, on environment and climate change, addressing the pressing issues of climate change, emphasizing sustainable development and environmental conservation, including the mountain economy. We would also need to amplify our voices in the climate discourse as developing countries by working together. Thirdly, on security and disaster management, ensuring regional security, energy cooperation, and effective disaster management strategies to safeguard our communities. Cybersecurity is one area where our cooperation will also be critical. In agriculture and food security, advancing agricultural practices and ensuring food security is vital for the well-being of our populations. Fifthly, on people-to-people -people contact, enhancing cultural and social ties among our peoples, fostering mutual understanding and cooperation, easing visa arrangements wherever they exist, which will in turn drive tourism and business. There needs to be far more exchanges among our citizens and especially among our young people. In science, technology, and innovation, taking initiatives in science and technology, driving innovation, and human resource development. On connectivity, improving regional transport and communication connectivity, digital connectivity, developing seamless product markets, enhancing infrastructure and transportation networks that link our nations. While we have made significant strides as a grouping, the op opportunities to do more are considerable. Fortunately, though, we notice a great desire among all member states to move quickly on all these fronts. The strength of BIMSTEC lies in its robust yet flexible governance structure. Our charter and decision-making mechanisms, including summits and ministerial meetings, ensure that our actions are well coordinated and effective. This augurs well for future action. BIMSTEC stands at the cusp of a transformative journey. Our vision for the future is clear. To create a region marked by shared prosperity, sustainable development, and peace and security for all. By navigating the future together, we can unlock the full potential of our region benefiting not only our nations, but also contributing to global stability and global growth. Together, we can make Bingstek a beacon of hope and progress in the Bay of Bengal and beyond. I look forward to listening to the presentations on this subject by our learned panel of experts. I thank you for your patience. Many thanks, sir, for very insightful uh, remarks. Uh, we have some time, so would you like to take some questions or comments, sir? 
So uh, now floor is open for uh, questions and comments. Sir, I don't know, for the presidential address and uh, for chief guests, normally we don't follow this, but since you have given me the opportunity, I'm grateful. Uh, because one question has intrigued me since 2010. So I'm presenting it today. Uh, actually, there, uh, once upon a time in one of my earlier assignments, I had closely worked with Navy, and we have OTE officers here. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they were very clear they wanted some uh, training on the languages which are uh, spoken in BIMSTEC countries for various reasons. Of course, we can understand them. When we are dealing with security and peace and we are dealing with the, the idea of uh, creating, of using language expression forms for creating a favorable uh, dialogic environment for the overall security and peace, including our own uh, interests. We can understand that. So, sir, in BIMSTEC, uh, can we expect some such initiatives, uh, whether in collaboration with others, those who are doing, because I know that some uh, people in Army also, they are working on it in their researches, etc. Because we need to take such initiatives also in terms of not only language, but uh, various uh, language expression forms. I'm using it uh, as a new expression, which might be taken to understand folklore because we have seen such uh, lures, the uses of the lures for the purposes of uh, what I call the favorable dialogic uh, environment for our purposes. Uh, do we or can we think of taking such initiatives in this field, sir? Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. And I would say uh, not just languages as well. Uh, I think within our region, for example, I can speak for myself uh, being an Indian, uh, how much do we know about the history of, say, Myanmar, you know, or of Thailand, or of even Bhutan, you know? We, we do not learn about the histories of our most immediate countries with which we are trying to build relationships. So whether it is in school or even at a higher level, th there is a complete lack of uh, both scholarship and study as, as well as teaching about uh, the people who are closest to us. So certainly, I think you have a valid point. We, even languages, I think, is important. I agree. Sir, uh, as a moderator, I take privilege to ask uh, one question. I noticed in uh, recent news report that there are several uh, research center and uh, a study center supported by Ministry of External Affairs and other BIMSTEC member countries are coming up. So, uh, because Nalanda also has a research center. So, uh, if uh, you could guide us, uh, tell us a little bit that uh, other than academic research which uh, we are working on and different courses, uh, what else would be more useful uh, as you are also preparing for vision document of the BIMSTEC? Uh, so that we can devote more energy in doing research in those areas. Uh, particularly, I am interested for our Center for Bay of Bengal Studies. You're right. I think uh, research and knowledge by itself is, of course, an end. But uh, it can also be used uh, for uh, generating um, prosperity and uh, economic development. So I would say, um, you know, um, to function as a think tank for academic purposes is fine, but to perform as a think tank for, say, industry or investment is also something that you can think about. Um, in the West, you have such think tanks which deal with, say, risk analysis. You know, they advise businesses about what uh, they can expect when they are going into another country, when they are investing in another country. So um, the scholarship and knowledge of our neighbors is important from that point of view as well. So you might consider looking at that part. And, and you could involve people from those countries in, the, in, in, in your think tank for that. Thank you, sir. If I may, one more, sir, because you mentioned about industries. 
And uh, earlier, uh, at least I am not aware if uh, there was much interactions with industry, particularly on BIMSTEC uh, Secretariat. But again, there was news report that this time uh, government is um, visualizing to engage industry and businesses also. So if you could enlighten a little bit on that, sir. So uh, we are having a BIMSTEC uh, business um, summit in, in August. So it will involve the uh, big businesses as well as uh, MSMEs from all over BIMSTEC countries. It's going to be held in New Delhi. CII is uh, uh, organizing it. And this is uh, an annual event that we will have. So this will be a major event. And even for the summit in Bangkok, we may have a side event, a business oriented side event as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, I am Azad Hind Gulshan Nanda, currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Nalanda University in the School of Historical Studies. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for this uh, today's inaugural session and very in, uh, in, you know, uh, enlightening start of the session. Uh, I want to know, sir, uh, just curious about with the revival of the new Nalanda University, how do you see the future of the Bay of Bengal? Uh, emerging as an interaction sphere, same like it's in the ancient past. It, uh, uh, the revival of Bay of Bengal as connecting the, uh, the economies of, of this region, uh, knowledge economies of this region. Yes, so in my uh, short presentation, of course, I didn't go into uh, details. But uh, one of the important areas that uh, we are looking at is to get far more people to people connect between the, peer, between the countries of this region. And of course, that connect uh, academicians, students, um, mm. think tanks are a very important part of that. Mm. So, um, so we have plans uh, on how to do it. Uh, we will be organizing far more interactions. They could be, um, you know, even say uh, young entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh, from all the BIMSTEC countries, then young postdoc students like you <laughs> uh, yes, who are working on uh, subjects related to the region or even if they are unrelated mm -hmm. to the region. Um, we are looking at young pro professionals from different fields. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that there has to be far more of people-to-people -people interaction in an organized way. Of course, a lot of people come as tourists mm -hmm. and yes, go from India to these countries as tourists. But um, uh, to have more focused interaction between the mm -hmm. people of the boats uh, uh, of all these countries would be something that we are looking at very, very seriously. Yes. Thank you, sir. Any other question from the floor? Sir. Please, please. Uh, Please introduce yourself, sir. Uh, good morning, gathering. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ravi Watts. Uh, my question to the Honorable Ambassador. Uh, sir, uh, we are looking at a very big political turmoil going on in Myanmar as of now. And you also talked about the risk analysis for the businesses. Sir, my school of thought is that uh, various schools of thought in the religion itself are mushrooming without a uh, proper umbrella which can guide them or which can bring them onto a central stage. Sir, India, can we be an ambassador of religious harmony or we can, you know, have a product of religious harmony? It will be better for us in a way that we will be able to engage them with more productivity, with more, you will say that more people will, uh, people to people connect with be increasing. And our own, that uh, multimodal transport corridor, which is in limbo now that. So how are we looking ahead? How are we are going to engage in these fields? Sir. Uh, you have encompassed a whole encyclopedia in your one question. Um, so uh, firstly, yes, Myanmar, a close nation, we share a very long border. We have uh, uh, many um, concerns about uh, the situation there. 
it does impinge on us in many diverse ways. Um, so um, um, certainly it is a very important country from that point of view as well, apart from being a neighbor with which we have tried and uh, uh, not only tried but have succeeded in having considerable bilateral cooperation in the past, whether it be in the law and order sphere, um, uh, combating insurgencies or uh, on the economic side, as you mentioned, the uh, Kaladan multimodal transport as well as the uh, trilateral highway. Uh, let me say that on the trilateral highway, um, although it is being challenging uh, since the last couple of years, but work has not stalled. Work is still going on. It might have slowed because of you know, difficulties in transporting material, uh, sometimes uh, security issues. But those security issues, uh, the work on the highway itself has never been targeted. And neither have our personnel ever been targeted by any side in, in the work that goes on there. And that is true also of the um, um, Kaladan uh, Multimodal Transport Corridor. Um, the problem is between different groups. And uh, so uh, whenever there is fighting, of course, work cannot proceed. So that slows it down. But we are not giving up on any of these projects. Uh, we, are also, uh, we have also started implementing uh, quick impact projects for locals in the, you know, in, at the village level. It could be a very small bridge from somewhere to somewhere. Uh, it could be a school somewhere, you know. So those kind of projects, we are still uh, very active. We have just started actually implementing them, even in this current scenario. So uh, we have our um, communication, our uh, relations with everybody there. So. Um, so I will not uh, uh, paint a too gloomy a picture about uh, our relations with Myanmar. Um, so the minister is also was here, last foreign minister was in Delhi uh, a couple of weeks ago. He's going to come again for the retreat. So we um, do emphasize that a return to democracy is something that we would like to see at the earliest. Uh, but it is to be something that comes out of Myanmar. You know, we do not arrogate to ourselves either a moral high ground in terms of uh, trying to preach to any side or, uh, as you mentioned, um, to be uh, uh, the moral leader of the, of the region to get people to become peaceful. Uh, I think that is, not, uh, that is not in our psyche. We lead by example, you know, people follow. Uh, people followed uh, the Buddha by example, and so we also think that uh, it is only when you um, lead by example that you know it, it is a better learning for others. Um, is there anything I did not cover? Uh, anything else that? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank. You. Adequately covered. Any question from our students sitting at the back? Please. You want to ask a question? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Heitmann. I'm from Germany. And uh, I've studied Tibetan studies for many, many years in combination with Indian studies. And I have experienced during 20 years of studies and being also professionally active that Bhutan is next to inaccessible for us Westerners, if I may use this term, politically hotly debated, but nevertheless. Um, this is one of the reasons why we have difficulties speaking about this country. This is one of the difficulties why we have, um, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have difficulties inviting them to our cultural background, to, in, to our society. This is one of the reasons why most of the people know a little bit about Bhutan because it seems to be quite a far off country with many exciting uh, secrecies and the like. But it, there is next to no connection, neither on the economical, nor on the cultural, nor on the research level. So if we like to know more about this country, we indeed have to have open doors there. And that's a problem. So what could one do there? It is a, we know from Tibetan studies, big influence, tradition, and so forth. We know all this. But uh, 
the present state, the present affairs are next to inaccessible. And one of the good reasons we think is because of what their statutes of statehood is uh, uh, about. Um, I must say I am a little surprised by your question um, because to my mind, Bhutan has, uh, is a very open country today in terms of if you wish to go and visit Bhutan, of course you can. Uh, it's not a place that is uh, forbidden. Uh, you just have to pay the $100 a day uh, extra charge for it. And that is a choice that they make. Uh, they want to have tourism at a level that is sustainable for their small country uh, and their small population. Um, they um, reach out to countries uh, when they uh, wish to. It is their sovereign decision. Um, they have relations with many countries. There are many ambassadors uh, in Delhi who are also concurrently accredited uh, there uh, in Bhutan. So um, everybody knows that, uh, uh, for example, they have uh, uh, the, uh, they, are, they are high on the World Happiness Index because they believe in uh, gross national happiness. Uh, and that is a choice that they make uh, in terms of how they interact with the rest of the world. So uh, uh, have you, uh, have you uh, tried to contact them? Have you tried to visit Bhutan? Uh, myself not. I'm a, a bit anxious as a woman to go alone up there into the country. But uh, a friend of mine, Professor Sörensen, he's a Tibetologist of good standing, and he has been working there. But the, uh, uh, let's say, the outcome of it is it is very secluded, and we have difficulties establishing research there even. So that, that's a problem for us because we, we don't have access to their libraries, we don't have access to the scholars, we don't have access to the society in general. If you go to England, it's easy. If you go to Bhutan, it's a problem. That is the, the case. Well, I can't speak for the Bhutanese, of course. That's a choice mm. uh, that they make. Um, but for Indians, of course, uh, we, are f we freely can travel in Bhutan. Um, uh, and similarly, the Bhutanese are free to travel in India. They, they don't require a visa. We don't require a visa to go there. Um, so there's a lot of coming and going between our countries. Um, but uh, as far as whether they wish to uh, maintain or they wish to start academic exchanges or think tank exchanges or uh, uh, research scholarship with uh, other universities across the world is really uh, up to them uh, to decide what they want to do. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't speak for them. No, no, you certainly cannot. But I think an input to open up so that more resources are available, more knowledge about the country can flow through the global atmosphere would be very appreciated. <laughs> Well, I, I was, as, as you heard, I was in uh, uh, Vienna uh, until uh, only a few months ago. And I do know uh, how much of interest there is uh, in Europe uh, regarding uh, this part of the world. And in fact, um, the first, I, I think one of the first uh, universities to offer a Sanskrit studies was the University of Vienna in uh, way back in yeah, 1846. I've studied my I PhD is from Vienna, so yeah. I've been there three mm. years myself. I know right. the situation quite well. Mm. So they would be delighted from the yes. Tibetan studies point sure. of view to have contacts with Bhutan, mm. but it is a problem. I find though that uh, the most of the interest is on Tibetan studies, not so much on uh, Bhutan, mm. Bhutan yes, studies. Yes, but why? Because, mm. because the access to the country and the mm -hmm. access to the culture is hardly is hard. It's difficult for us. That's why. That's well, why I, I must, thought maybe I it's from the Indian side to. I tell will convey this to the Bhutanese ambassador that in Delhi. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it has been very uh, stimulating session, and uh, um, I think uh, we have. Uh, uh, Ambassador Majumdar enlightened us through the approach, member countries as well as India, their uh, India's priority areas, and also answered several questions from the floor uh, 
So uh, this is the right time to break for a coffee. And please join me in thanking Ambassador Majumdar for a very enlightening session.